can I encourage you? Kingdom Festival. If you haven't purchased tickets already, get involved, purchase a ticket, get on team if you want to help serve. Just, but just be there. Don't miss it. It's an appointment of the Lord. And where the Lord makes an appointment, he turns up, and he turns up in a big way. And can I encourage you to invite friends, invite family, take a brochure, hand it out to a stranger on the street if you feel led. Find the one, give it to the one. That one person, pray to the Lord, who is the one, and, and, and be led to them. Give them the brochure, just say, I feel like the Lord told me to give this to you. And then carry on your merry way. What they do with the brochure, hopefully they choose to come, but if they don't, then they've made their choice. But you played your part. And the title of my message this morning, excuse me, is The One. So last night, I popped along to Rabina Stadium just to watch the Panthers and the Titans, just to have a bit of downtime. It's uh, Men sometimes like their alone time, and so I go to the rugby league, that's my alone time, where I'm uh, surrounded by a bunch of people I don't know, but I get to en- just sit there and enjoy the atmosphere. Last night, fortunately, my Panthers had come to town, so I got to watch them. And I was sitting there and I was looking around the crowd, and I think the attendance was around just over 18,000, I think it was. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if this was a kingdom festival with that atmosphere, the passion that mostly Panthers supporters, a few Titans, had for their team was... <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, was... was Amazing. I mean, there was cheering, there was screaming. And that's the sort of passion we should have for the Lord. You know, to, to be in an atmosphere like that. Imagine 18,000 people just worshipping God. And, and I think there's revivals going on in, in Brazil at the moment that, that would probably match that. Stadiums filled with people just worshipping the Lord and coming to the Lord. Imagine, imagine the power of an appointment of God filled with 18,000 people in a stadium, and the Lord turned up. I don't think there would be one person standing. But hey, that's, that's the future. But let's, let's, let's give Pastor Kyle a headache. Let's sell out the venue we're at and have to find a bigger venue for this year. Let's get involved. Let's get out there. So the Lord has been leading me recently a little bit, um, and a few things. And one of the scriptures he led me to was Isaiah 54.2. And if we can turn there, it says, Enlarge the place of your tent, and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. I felt like the Lord just kept impressing that scripture on my heart. And he kept speaking to me about kingdom as we grow, as we move to two services, as we make room as we strengthen and we grow in our teaching, we develop things like the milk course, our life groups grow, we are setting the table for those that will come. Let's read you something that I felt as I sat with the Lord I wrote. Kingdom has moved to two services. There are teaching courses. We are ready now. We must go out from these four walls and bring people in. The table has been prepared and awaits the guests. Who will bring the family? The scene is set for the return of those that have been held captive. It is not for us to determine who is reachable, or sorry, who is unreachable, but to be willing to reach the ones that God tells us to reach, without question. The table is set. Will we play our part? Hmm. The view from the church, we look out into a world that is hurting, a world 
that is transitioning into this place of anything goes, anything is acceptable. I see a place where you choose what you want to be. You can tell people you're a cat and identify as a cat. You can, you can be a millionaire and identify as a millionaire without the million dollars. But, hey, I still identify as being a millionaire. I can go out and buy all these lavish things with the money I don't have. We are heading down a dark path. There's, there's alcohol, there's drugs, there's separated families, divorces running rampant. And we in the church aren't immune to these things either. The divorce rate in the church is going through the roof. And I know it's hard to hear, and I'm not going to preach to that topic today, but it's time to us to come into alignment with the Word of God. It's time for us to strengthen the church from within. So when we bring people in, we are ready and equipped to deal with their issues and we're not constantly dealing with our own. The only place we're going to get to that is when we read this and we obey this and we live to this word of God. And when we get there, we as people will be equipped. But it's not to say we're not ready now because the Lord is waiting on us. The one. Let me turn to Matthew, if we can. Matthew 28. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping here. Matthew 18, verses 12 to 14. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I'll tell you a story about a, a young man, roughly seven, eight years old, at a Christian camp. And he was in a hall on his own and he was standing there swinging punches, pretending he was fighting against the devil when he was going to take the devil out. He was an MMA superstar, maybe, I don't know, but he was going to knock the devil out and he was going to show him who was boss because he was a young man that had grown up with a Christian mum and an unsaved dad, but he loved the Lord as a young man because he'd grown up with a mum that loved the Lord and he looked to mum at that point. But then he got to an age, eight or nine, that he probably started to look to his dad a little bit. And by the age of 12, he wanted to hang out with dad. So at this point, he was going to church, but he, he chatted with mum and, and dad went sailing and he was a yachty and he loved the drinking lifestyle. He was a bit of a, a play around sort of boy, but he, he liked the high life. And so this, this young fellow wanted to hang out with dad and go out yachting and, and most of the yacht races took place on a Sunday. So mum, being a good mum, wanted to get that connection between dad and son. So she agreed to it. Unfortunately, this led to the son following in dad's footsteps and drifting away from the church. And as he, as he, as he went along, he sort of got tangled up in the alcohol, he got tangled up in the drugs. He started playing rugby league, wanted to hang out with the boys, loved winter time because league season came back around and it was back into it, play footy on Saturday, hit the pubs, the clubs on the, the Saturday night afterwards, drinking, smoking cigarettes, taking drugs, doing all this sort of worldly stuff that I, I kind of see a lot of Christians now look at that and go, oh, no, stay away from that bloke. You know, he's a, he drinks, he parties, he's a clubber. Probably the exact guy we're called to reach, but we, we tend to stay away because, you know, stranger danger, I, I don't know. I don't know why we do that now. 
maybe we're safe, we've become insular and we've become safe in our churches. So anyway, this carried on for many years and he grew up. And many years after he'd retired, he went into coaching and he was coaching a footy team. And this younger fella turned up to play. And this young fella was a, a bit of a church goer. And so he used to walk past this coach and he just walked past and say, oh, God loves you, man, and keep walking. And the coach would be like, Flip, keep away from me, bro. You, you know, you're a little bit out there, freaky sort of thing. And, uh, but he just used to constantly walk past every Saturday, just make a little comment as he went past. Oh, I think one of them was, uh, you know, God's got his hand on you and he's never stopped pursuing you. And he, just every week, Jesus loves you. God loves you. Every week. Anyway, footy season finished and this, this guy that was coaching the team, he'd come over to the Gold Coast. He was going to a Bucks party and he, he hit the alcohol pretty hard and, and took, some, took some drugs. And, and the next, uh, next day, as, he, as he, he had a pretty rough day, pretty t- rough 12 hours, he was vomiting in and out of bed, very sick, pretty close to death, I think. Um, probably had alcohol poisoning to go along with the drugs that he probably didn't realise he had. And anyway, he woke up after those 12 hours and something in him clicked. Something changed and shifted. And he thought, I need to go to church. I need to go back to New Zealand and go to church because this lifestyle is going to kill me. So he went back to New Zealand and he went to church. And now... I stand before you today on a platform as a pastor because one man, one man I'm forever thankful for said yes to God because God said that is the one, that is the one you're to go after and he never gave up for a year. He kept saying those things, God loves you. Jesus loves you. God's hands all over you. He's not going to stop pursuing you. And the man that I am today that stands before you knew that. I could feel the weight of the Lord's hand coming upon me, yet I was still trying to run. But the Lord would not stop pursuing me because he loved me too much. And I realized that the thing I was running from wasn't Jesus himself. It was the fact that I could not believe that anybody would love me that much. Because I grew up in a a household where my dad, because of his background, didn't know how to love his sons. Never was able to tell, until very recently, never able to tell his sons that he loved them. So I never heard that. So I thought this man you talk of, this Jesus, he's a man, he doesn't love. You know, he's just hard on you and pushes you. That was the interpretation. But I've learned as I've journeyed on my Christian walk after that morning when I woke up that Jesus, he's a God of love. He loves his people so much, even me. Even the the kid that was, or man that was living in a place of, of sin, he was drinking, he was taking drugs. He loved me too much to leave me there. But the point of that story is not so much my walk but the guy that said yes to God, the guy that said, I will go after the one. I will not stop until he comes to the Lord. So we look out at the world and we see this. We see the drugs, we see the alcohol. We peek out of the trenches almost and we go, ooh, that battleground out there is just, yeah. That, that's not for me. I'm, I'll stay in the trenches. I'll keep my head down. That's the safe place to be. But if we look at Matthew 28, the Great Commission, the last command that the Lord left with us before he went to heaven or went to be with the Lord at the right hand of the, the Father, in Matthew 28, 18 to 20,
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Lord is with us when we go out. He is with us when we go out to reach these people. We have a place here on the Gold Coast full of hurting and lost people. And we walk past them and we look at them and we think, young kids out partying again, young kids taking drugs, older men doing the same thing. Yeah, it's so sad. If only they knew better. How will they know better if we don't go? How will they know better if we don't leave these four walls and go out and reach them? These these people are hurting. I was there once, and there's probably others here that were there. They're hurting. They're looking for love, but they've hardened themselves because of the pain that they've endured in life. We see where they're at now. We don't see where they've come from. We don't see the life that they've had to endure that's brought them to the place they're at now. Maybe it just took someone back then to reach out to them, but is it too late now? No. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord to show you somebody. Who is the one that you want me to go after? And when the Lord puts someone on your heart, don't look at them and go, hmm, nah, too hard basket. I'll go over here and I'll wait for your next option. Go after them. You don't need to know the gospel inside out. You don't need to be a great evangelist. You don't need to be Billy Graham or, or any of those guys. My, this guy I couldn't stand became my good friend and my flatmate. And I couldn't stand him when he was preaching Jesus to me because I didn't want to hear it. But he didn't stop. And all he said to me, simple things like, God loves you. He didn't need to preach a big message to me. But every time he said that, something was penetrating my heart. And it broke me down. And not in a bad way. He saved my life. He saved my life. And then the Lord took me and saved me from eternal death because of the price he paid. Be that person that's willing to go after the one. There are so many opportunities out there. Change and flip your perspective to the fact that every person walking past it is unsaved is an opportunity. I don't know. Maybe the Lord says, this person walking towards you down the street, just walk past them and say, God loves you. Don't be afraid. Just walk past them. God loves you. You might never see them again or you might see them in church six months' time on a Sunday. And think, wow, that's that person I told them God loves. God loves them. Don't give up on people. They are too precious to God. They should be too precious to us. Too precious. Everybody out there, we should love. That's what we're called to be, called to do, is to love people and reach the lost. Bring them in here so they can hear of a Savior that loves them so much, a God that loves them so much who was too good to leave them the way they were. He was too good to leave me the way I was. And he's too good to leave you the way you are. And he's still working on me. He's very patient too. I give him that. He works with me. Work in progress as we all are. I'll tell you a story about a guy that was in New Zealand. Now, I don't know if this story is true or it's not, but I heard it in church once, spoken from the pulpit, and I believe it to be true. There was a man in New Zealand, and he used to preach up in K Road on on a corner. And K Road would be like King's Cross, for those that don't know. So it was a rough area, uh, a lot of drugs, a lot of alternative lifestyles, very lost people. And he would stand up there every week, and he would preach the gospel. 
And he got to an elderly age. I think he'd been doing it 20, 30 years, a very, very long time. And he sat down and said to the Lord in prayer, Lord, I have come here every week, every week. I have preached your gospel. I have spoken your word and not one person has come to salvation. Not one. I just want one. So a little while later, I don't know exactly how long, but a little while later, a a gentleman approached him as he was standing there preaching and said, I just wanted to come and thank you. And he said, thank me for what? He said, because of you, I came to the Lord. And now I have an international ministry that reaches hundreds, thousands of people. The one man that he knew of that had said yes to Christ because of his preaching had gone out and reached hundreds, maybe thousands because he had said yes and turned up faithfully every week to preach. And he didn't stop. He was unrelenting. So he didn't just reach one person. He reached hundreds and thousands and who knows how many down the generations because he said yes to Christ. Imagine if you, if we invited just one person and they said yes. Imagine if you invited 100 and out of 100, 99 said no, but one said yes. Imagine if we all did that over the next year. Here's a challenge. Let's all do it over the next year. Invite as many people as you can. And maybe just one says yes. Let's find a new building next year. Because we'll be full. We'll be overflowing. And if we set that challenge every year, imagine the amount of kingdom churches we would be able to start planting around the Gold Coast and extend out and extend out to we're reaching the world. Because that's what the scripture said on expanding your tent packs. The nation's. The Gold Coast, full, full of foreigners. And they come here for a while and then they go home. Imagine if we reach one from Brazil, one from England, one from Japan, so on and so forth. And then they went back home and they started ministries to reach the lost. We are reaching the nations. Let's go after the one. That's, that's, that's what I'm about today. I'm about encouraging us to go after the one. Don't be afraid. We're full of courage. The Lord said to Joshua when he was going to take Jericho, be bold, be courageous. When someone says to me, be something, I'm like, oh, so you're telling me that's already inside of me. And you're telling me to be that person, the person I already am. When you go out there on the streets, just be bold and be courageous. Spread the gospel. Talk about Jesus. I work at a place in a very un, what people some people would think is a, a very unfriendly environment. I'm in civil construction. I sat at a table the other day and I sort of sat there and I looked around and I was like, well, I had a, probably seven guys sitting at this table. Five of them have been in prison. But you know what? They all know I'm a pastor in a church. I'm quite open about it. And one of them just out of the blue the other day says to me, oh, Ryan, um, yeah, I've just given away drugs and... You know, and I'm stopping the alcohol, I'm stopping the drugs, I've had enough of that lifestyle. I said, mate, good on you. That's wonderful. For all the people he could have told on site, why did he come and tell me? Because he knows the lifestyle I live. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I can reach that one. Just give me time. Now I'll just continue on in conversation. How you going, man? You still, you still doing, keeping on track? Yeah. Oh, okay. No worries. You know, just a slow progression. If it takes me two or three years to get them across the line as such into church, it's worth it. If I never get the opportunity, maybe something I say to him might spark it further down the track. Maybe five or ten years he'll walk into a church because of the little part I played. Don't, don't not chase after the one. Tanya. I don't know the name of your son, sorry, so I apologise for this, but would it be all right just to bring him forward? I just want to speak something to him, yeah, if that's okay. So 
Samuel, I see you before sitting in the back there and you're quite often, you, you sit and you, you're quiet. And you just sit there patiently and you come in and out with mum and dad. You're not outspoken, but I see within you, my son, a voice, a big voice. I see within you a boldness of like a lion that's just, that's in there. And it just wants to come out. And you know, you might sit there quietly, but I really believe that in the right environment, in the right situation, that that lion that's inside of you will come out. I think you've got on you a, a gift, a gift to reach the lost. And you've got a steel in your eye. You can stare a grown man in the eye. That takes courage and boldness. My friend, I think there's a calling on your life that they will see you reach many, many, and you're equipped for it. Let's pray for you, Ben. Family, friends, it's time to get out of the trenches. It's time to pop our heads up, climb out of the trench and go to war. We can't leave a lost and hurting country, a lost and hurting state like Queensland. We can't leave them out there. We've got to have the courage, the boldness. We've got to go into enemy territory and claim back those that have been taken captive. The reason we see, I believe, so much what we perceive as darkness in our world now it's because a light has been shined upon the world. It's always been there. It's just been hidden away. But as the light comes up on the world, it becomes more exposed. See, the Lord's coming again and the time is short. We need to go to war. We need to fight the battle. We need to go out there and bring the captives in. Go out in the name of Jesus. Go out and fight for the cause of Christ. He died for you. He died for me. He died for everyone that's out there. But how will they know if we don't go? How will they know if we don't open our mouths and tell them of the one that saved us? The one that's given us eternal life. And it's there for them too. But they don't know. They won't know unless we're willing to go. You know, my mates back in New Zealand, Steve, he was a bit of a rough-looking dude. I used to call him the, the skater evangelist because he used to hang around the skate parks. He was nothing special to look at, you know, like he just your rugged skater with the beard and wavy hair. But man, he loved God. He was so passionate about God and he just wanted to tell anyone who would listen. He would rock up beside people at a skate park, sit down and go, hey, bro, I want to tell you about a friend of mine called Jesus. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, okay. Like, what do you say to some bloke that comes up bold as a lion and just sits down and says, I want to tell you about Jesus. Okay. The amount of guys that he brought to church just because he was willing to say yes. He was willing to go to that skate park every Sunday, hang out, jump on his skateboard, talk to the young fellas, invite them to church. He's a bit more refined and classy now. He's a bit older, but he's a, he's a good man, and I love him to bits. But he will go and talk to anybody. And he's not well-spoken. Not well spoken at all. You know, he doesn't have all the gifts of class. He doesn't have the gifts of being able to speak well. He just said yes to God. And he has just, over the years, developed into the most amazing evangelist. Where he just brings so many people to church because he'll just say yes. He'll go, he'll be out at a restaurant sitting having dinner with his wife and go, oh, you know, and they'll be on a date night. He's just, oh, sorry, babe, that guy over there, God just told me to go and talk to him. And off he goes. And she's like, okay. Because she knows it's a calling on his life to 
to do this. But it's a calling that's growing. Because one day he said yes and just went about it. So just encourage everybody here to, to be the one that chases the one. Go after the one. Just let me ask a question. Therese, is that time? Two minutes? Sorry, I just saw it off there. Let me just choke it back for a moment. We're good. Okay. People are so precious. Let me get out from behind this thing. They are so precious. They are so loved. They're all God's creation. All of them. All of them. Not one of them are not God's creation. And his word says, I don't want one person to perish. Not one. We have to climb out of the trenches. We have to follow the last command that Jesus left with us before he went to be with the Father. Go into your backyard. Go into the nations, wherever the Lord calls you to go. Go and reach people because they need Christ as much as we need him. Maybe they need him more. I don't know everybody's story here or where you're at. We all need the saviour we all need Christ imagine standing in eternity when you get there and looking around and the Lord says see that section over there and I I think I've heard Tash say this before as well see that section over there a couple of thousand people the other people that were saved because you said yes and went and reached that one or two or three or hundred people because you said yes Well done, good and faithful servant. Souls matter to God and they should matter to us. We need to be about the Father's work. We're here because someone chased us down or someone chased our parents down or their parents. If you've been a Christian for many generations in your family, at some point... Someone said, yes, I will go. It's our calling. It's our purpose. Let me just pray. Father, I thank you, Father, for each one here. Lord, I've tried to articulate in my way as best I can what you've placed on my heart, the passion to reach the lost, the passion to to chase after those that need to hear you, that need to know you, the one. Lord, I just ask you, Father, to touch each heart here. Place in each person a burning desire, an ache, a passion to go after the one and help them to know who that one is and then who the next one is and the next one, Father. Let us be unrelenting in our search and our passion to see the great commission fulfilled, to see your courts filled with people worshipping you in eternity. I thank you in, in, in Jesus' name. Can I just talk quickly to those that might be here that have never been had or been given or maybe you have been given maybe you came into church for a little while and then life circumstances like me as a young fellow it dragged you away but you know you know the truth it's it's in everybody's heart some of us we've hardened ourselves a little bit to it others you're at a place where you're soft but the lord is a god of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. It goes on and on because he will pursue you to the very end. He will keep calling you to the very end and give you every opportunity he can to come to him and to believe and to receive him as your saviour.
His love is too great to leave one behind. But can I speak personally to you? If you have walked away, maybe you just have never known Christ, but today, like I did many years ago, you, you think, I want to give Jesus a go. I want to give Him the reins of my life. Maybe I haven't done it as well as I could. Maybe I have regrets. He wants to take those regrets and forgive them and push them away as far as the east is from the west and bring you close to Him, heal you and restore you to how He created you to be. So if that's you, then I'd ask ask that you'd raise your hand if, if you're online, then maybe you could just let us know or call the office during the week and, and we can pray with you, but I'd love that opportunity and, and everyone here would love the opportunity if it's not me to pray with you and, and to see you receive Christ as your Saviour and begin the exciting journey that will lay before you. So if that's you, I'd just ask that you'd raise your hand. I take it that everyone here is a follower of Christ, so that is more than wonderful. And if you're online, please feel free to contact us in the office via email or phone or text during the week, and, and we will give you a call and we'll pray with you and help you where we can to connect with us or with with another church in your area. We would love that opportunity. So just, uh, just thank you. Just love you, family. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves all of us. The Lord loves everyone out there too. So, so excited to see this family grow and grow and grow and grow. More and more people coming in and just seeing them give their lives to Christ. Is, that is the most exciting thing, I think, that I've ever experienced for myself personally and that I get to see, I get the privilege to see. I celebrate with all of heaven when you give your life to Christ and when we see others do that. So thank you, family. Love you. And if you want to come forward for prayer, if you need healing in the body, if you just want to have prayer for what I've spoken about today, just encouragement and prayer, then please come forward. Let us pray with you. Never stand back. Never be ashamed. Never hide away. We all need prayer. And if you want it today, then I'll pray with you, Pastor Kyle, Pastor Greg, whoever's available. We'll pray with you in whatever area you need. Just come forward and bring it to the altar. Thank you, family.